Police officers who have arrested other police officers. What's the story? Story one. This was during my time as a United States Marine Corps MP. Never arrested another police officer during my other gigs. Got a phone call from the guy's wife saying he was drunk and refusing to leave the house. Knocked on the front door, but found him crying on the porch about his wife leaving him because she wasn't happy anymore. She walked by the porch and motioned for me to come inside through the glass door. She proceeded to show me the red marks on her throat, the hole in the door that he punched through beside her head, and some other evidence that doesn't need to be disclosed. After asking him to come inside and get dressed, he refused to leave with me. I wasn't going to handcuff him in front of his kid, but he decided to take that moment to run from me. He was faster and got away for about five minutes before I found him walking through a playground a couple buildings over. Caught up to him, he punched me, but was taken into custody after a slight use of force. On the way to the station, he tried to kick out a window in my cruiser and told me I was ruining his life. He ended up getting charged with about seven different charges and was kicked out of the Marines. On his way out, he lied to NCIS and got an investigation opened on me for assault. Investigation was completed thoroughly, and all charges against me were marked as unsubstantiated. But the charges still showed up after I got out and went through a background check for my security clearance. Ten out of ten. Would. Do. Again. My slight inconvenience, totally worth it for him to go down for domestic assault charges. Narrator's commentary. I have a feeling I'm going to like this thread. I feel like I hear so much about officers protecting other officers when really they should be treated the same as other citizens when they do something wrong. Story two. I actually have had to arrest three separate members of the justice system this year. First, a practicing lawyer and former judge who had been utilizing his position to coerce acts from defendants. He utilized this leverage even after he wasn't a judge anymore. Investigation by DCI revealed he had about a dozen victims. So a warrant for his arrest was made, which I executed. Arresting a guy you used to put defendants in front of is a very odd feeling. He weaseled out of prison time and got it all suspended and put on a direct supervision probation program. Absolute horse crap. I've seen guys do way less and get way more time. But it's not really a secret that money has a habit of tipping the scales of justice. Next was a prison guard who strangled his girlfriend, then stalked her relentlessly. I actually arrested him twice because after he posted bail on the first one, he was spotted lurking outside her home only 45 minutes after being released. He's currently in on felony assault, strangulation of a household member, and felony violation of a protection order. He's still in my jail awaiting trial with a bail that has been substantially increased. I'm anticipating prison time for him, but only time will tell third was a city police officer, I'm a county deputy sheriff because we received a call from a six-year-old that his dad was in the garage doing drugs and wouldn't come out. Showed up to find four very young kids running around unsupervised. It was a city police officer smoking ice that he had confiscated during a traffic stop, and he didn't report it or turn it into evidence. DCI took the case from us due to the potential conflict of interest and have placed him in another county's jail, and I haven't heard any more about it. Hope he does time, too. What kind of jerk leaves his little kids totally alone and unsupervised while they smoke hard drugs? Especially when said person is a frickin' cop. Unforgivable, in my opinion, but yeah. 2020 has been a very strange year for me. We have a membership for those who like more naughty and interesting stories that aren't advertiser-friendly. Check out the link in the description and join our amazing Confessions community so you can support the channel. Story 3. Not me but my dad, who was a cop. He was still working as a full-time cop before switching full-time to firefighting and made a traffic stop around 11 at night back in the mid-80s. Nicer car, speeding well over the limit, so my dad initiates a stop. Before he's out of his cruiser, the driver has what looks like a badge hanging out of the window. My dad walks up, does the usual song and dance, and the driver said, you obviously can't freaking see who I am, my dad says. Uh, yes, sir, I do, and right now I'm conducting a traffic stop. Turns out the driver was a lieutenant colonel in the Ohio State Highway Patrol, which is pretty high up in their rank structure. My dad again asks him for license and insurance, and the guy goes off threatening to call Dick, as in Dick Celeste, who was the governor at the time, and threatening his job, saying he was just trying to get back to Columbus after an engagement, and so on. Eventually, he calls for backup and has another officer there to witness what was going on. Eventually, my dad writes him a ticket, and while still screaming, Mr. Pulling Rank drives away. The next shift, my dad gets called in by his assistant chief and is asked about the stop. 
Apparently, the colonel of OSHP was calling him about it. In the end, they had to bring in the other officer to write a statement of what went on. And in the end, nothing came of it except the ticket wasn't contested and paid. Narrator's commentary. The absolute gall and ego he must have to be like, I wasn't doing anything wrong. I'm too important for that. Yeah, right, buddy. You're not above anyone else because of your rank. Well, okay. Hierarchically, yes. In society, no. Story four. Probationary officer goes on a blind double date with his roommate. Been at the racetrack drinking, so they take the train to downtown. Everyone is pretty drunk, him in particular. Maybe to entertain or show off for his date, he's acting goofy. As everyone is getting off the train, he sees some guy bent over tying his shoes. Rocket scientist decides to leapfrog over the guy. Only neither of them have much balance. Probationary cop basically jumps over Slash on the guy and drives his face straight into the pavement because he's too drunk and the guy wasn't expecting it. Everyone jumps up and he starts trying to defuse the situation he just caused. Turns out the guy is a 17-year-old kid heading down to spend the weekend with his grandparents, who now has two broken teeth and a broken nose. The drunk cop starts saying stuff like, it's okay, it'll be fine, I'm a cop, it's all good. When he realizes the crowd isn't going to let him walk away, he bails on foot and tries to run off. A few guys chase him down and grab him. Cops get called and detain him. I was the on-call detective who was called out at 10, 30, to handle the case. He refused to answer any questions and was booked in for felony battery, based on the extent of injuries and age of the victim. He never made it off probation and resigned. Story 5. Ex-Sheriff's Deputy here. One night on shift, I had the great misfortune to overhear on the radio that a small local chief of police, the whole department was only three people, was not answering a radio call. So my shift partner goes out to the call they were trying to get him to go to, and I make my way to try to locate this chief of police. On my way to the police station, thinking maybe he's just asleep on the couch, I see his squad car pulled off onto the side of the road. Lights going. In that moment, my heart sank. My first thought was, oh no. This dude just lost his life in a traffic stop. As I'm walking up to the car in a hurry, I noticed he slumped over. I reached into the open driver's window and grabbed his shoulder to try to put my fingers against his neck to feel if he has a pulse, just generally checking if he's still alive. As I'm doing this, I notice a distinct and strong odor of alcohol. As the chief of police wakes up, looks at me, puts the car in drive, and pulls away. About that time, another deputy pulls up behind my car, and I pull out my radio that the chief is driving off. Uh, the other deputy, forgetting that we all use a shared frequency, then comes over the radio saying, hey, he should be easy to follow. His lights are on. And well, the lights go off. Fast forward to several hours later, command staff is out at the police department seizing the weapons and evidence that's stored within it. This chief of police shows up with the mayor of the small town and submits himself to a breathalyzer. He barely passes. Fun fact, district attorneys do not like prosecuting chiefs of police especially when politics are starting to get involved. Unrelated to that, I was let go about two weeks later for calling a suspect a jerk. Unprofessional conduct, apparently. Story six, former police officer and correctional officer here. I never actually arrested a fellow cop myself. However, my field training officer was arrested and fired from my former PD twice for drunken disorderly before I worked there. He got his job back twice through union arbitration and to his credit, gave up drinking. When I was working at the jail, we had a cop who was put in a protective custody slash self-harm watch after being arrested for stalking a woman he met on a call. He got obsessed with her and kept bothering her after the fact, and after she reported him, he made threats against her. A fellow CEO at my jail was arrested for producing and distributing child content. He got girls as young as nine to send him nude photos, which he distributed on the dark web. He's doing 25 years in prison, minimum. He won't be eligible for parole for another 15 or so. We had seven officers at the jail beat a disabled inmate and then lie about it on their reports. The shift commander then tried to erase the video. All were fired and arrested, but later were acquitted of all charges. Sad thing was, they were all guilty as hell. Story 7. Saw a true crime video where this police officer ended his ex-wife's life because she was trying to divorce him, and she had a really nice life insurance. He was struggling hella hard with bills, and apparently the crime split the whole police department up. People who thought he was guilty versus the people who couldn't believe it, and thought he wasn't. In the end, he was caught, because he was the only one who had keys to the car she drove, and the police found a paper with calculations on it, which detailed how much he would have left over after the life insurance money paid off his debt in his house. Oh, and he was sleeping around with a co-worker, also to add context on why the department was split 
The side that was on his side were co-workers for years. They simply couldn't believe that someone they had worked alongside with could do that. He had a good reputation at work, but at home, he was different. The evidence I said was pretty much the last missing factors because the cops had a very hard time building a case. He covered his tracks really well. Plus, he made sure he had a strong alibi. He honestly would have gotten away with it. In the beginning, he was helpful and gave as many statements as the cops needed. But the more evidence the cops were picking up, the more he started resisting. And he wasn't compliant anymore. He was actually very abusive towards her, but she was the main breadwinner of the house. She got tired of it and was trying to move on and settle the divorce as calmly and nicely as possible. But he wasn't complying. It got to the point where he would break in the house whenever he wanted. Plus, he would leave her recorded messages on the home phone. Since she was a nurse, she recorded all calls because sometimes her patients would call her and ask questions or whatever. But when the cops searched her place, they thought it was very weird how those tapes from his calls were missing. After all, he had a key. Plus, the murder was done in her work parking lot, and his alibi was strong, but it seemed very plotted. On top of that, they got confirmation he rented a van. The same looking van that the van jumped into after he ended her life in the parking lot. Police couldn't trace the license plate because they were going off the cameras from the car dealership across the street. It was too far to get a clear reading on it. Oh, and he had a very good reputation at work. He just had a crap ton of circumstantial evidence against him. Story 8. I'm an actual cop, so I'll give an answer. I've arrested 12 cops for DUI, two of which included charges of possessing weapons while intoxicated. I've arrested one cop for writing a check on a closed account, another for violating protection order during a very ugly divorce. I have assisted the feds on a couple of tax-related arrests. I've also arrested a total of three cops for dereliction of duty. One of those cops was a cop who didn't arrest or conduct a DUI investigation after a crash involving another cop. All those cases proceeded in a similar fashion, as other people with similar backgrounds slash criminal records would have with similar offenses. The slap on the wrist is actually really common and the norm with first-time offenders. Also, the things I found cops arrested for are generally the same things other middle-class, blue-collar workers get in trouble for. Issues with substance abuse, particularly alcohol, and financial problems. My career is perfectly fine. I faced absolutely no negative repercussions for many of my peers. I'd say if you work for a large enough agency, you've probably arrested or written a ticket to a cop. Story 9. Not a cop but a former dispatcher who filed a complaint against another dispatcher for jeopardizing public and officer safety. This person did not like me and would intentionally withhold information and not enter it into CID, causing me on radio to have delays in responding to officer questions. When I finally had enough and reported this person to assistant chief, I was sent home. Two days later, I was fired for abandoning post even though I never left. I called both the chief and the assistant chief out during my termination for this being a case of good old boys and collected my personal belongings. To this day, people ask me all the time why it is when they call 911 in this particular city. They get told to hold. My response is usually that the dispatcher is most likely finishing their game of Candy Crush first. The thin yellow line, dispatcher and I hear the thin blue line, cops are to never be crossed. You're either with them or against them. Edit. To those who say I should have reported it at the time, yes, I should have. But I was devastated to lose that job, and my only focus was to find a new job to keep money coming in. At this point, I don't know if the dispatcher is there anymore. I know the admins have changed with retirements and mayoral appointments. There's a group mentality to being a dispatcher or a cop, but by and large, most do the work because they want to serve their communities. Being a dispatcher, even for my short time, was both the hardest and one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. There are calls I'll never forget, both for the sheer horror of them and also for the absolute insanity they brought forth. Thanks to all who read this, and please take a moment to consider that the person on the phone when you call 911 or emergency services rarely gets closure. All too often, when we send out the appropriate people, that's the end for us. There are calls that shake you to the core and forever you wonder, did I do everything I could and are they okay? Story 10. Not a police officer, but I worked as a contractor for law enforcement's digital evidence lab. There was a new guy who had just retired as a cop, but came on because he wanted to do computer forensics and supposedly had some background in it. We were in training together, learning about cell phone forensics, when he missed a day of training. That night, he was on the news because he had been arrested after cops closed in on him for soliciting texts and pictures from underage girls. 
We weren't part of the investigation, but did send his work computer over to the lab that was working on it, and he had content on it. Overall, we were all shocked, but also could not chuckle at the irony that he was a computer forensics analyst. Who didn't know how to hide evidence on a computer? Story 11, domestic violence. Not much of a story, pretty clear cut. Luckily, it was a visiting family, so not someone I knew. Other than that, I once tackled a guy who was fighting in a bar and threw cuffs on him only to find out later that he was a cop. Should have known when he immediately put his hands behind his back when I told him to instead of trying to fight me as drunks tend to do. Detained, but didn't arrest him because I didn't actually see him punch anyone, and disorderly conduct has a lot of discretion involved, and I don't know who started it. Gave both parties the information needed to file charges against the other, and a report was completed. Just a reminder that an arrest is not supposed to be a punishment. Being charged with a crime is the issue. I think DUI is the most common, but I never did much traffic enforcement. Story 12. Not sure if it counts exactly as asked, but 2009. I've got a background in law enforcement, so as an army officer recovering from combat injuries, I found myself as the operations officer for a post slash base DES slash Department of Emergency Services, which included the MPs, and law enforcement for the post slash base. My office was across the hall from the actual MP director's office. He stepped in and asked how busy I was. I was busy, but wanted any excuse to get away from the monotonous BS I was working on. So I said, screw it, what do you need, sir? He was handling a case personally and wanted another officer as witness in documentation and processing. An officer's wife had been convinced to come in by a couple of other officer's wives. She was a bitch battered mess. Face was swollen, and even though she cleaned herself up, she was hard to look at without just getting upset. Female officers, of course, did the actual inspections and physical documentation, but the director was running the investigation himself. He had called the officer in off patrol and confronted him with me present as witness. Dude tried joking it off that he just got drunk and a little out of control. Long eight-ish month story shortened. His case was transferred to a civilian police department for her good. Not from reprisals or anything, for benefits. He was convicted of DV, which put him out of the MPs and lost him his ability to own slash carry a firearm. So he was also discharged from the military, losing him his career. I believe he also served some time in a civilian jail, but not sure. She was granted a divorce, and because we sent it to a civilian court and he was not court-martialed, she still got to keep divorced spouse married for over 10 years benefits for her instead of losing all benefits. Which is why it was transferred to a civilian department. I really liked that director. He did not tolerate BS from among his officers. Story 13. Not a cop yet, yes, I know, but this is a hilarious story. The city police department had gotten their first internet computer in the early 2000s, and one of the two female officers was having trouble with it. She had spent an hour screaming, hitting, and yelling at it before pulling out her gun and shooting it. The other female officer, who is my sister's future mother-in-law, had to take her down and arrest her for unlawful use of a service weapon and destruction of municipal property. The charges were dropped because she asked if she could quit instead. Also, with the conditions of losing her pension and benefits and going to therapy. Now she's been living life as a grandmother and helping kids with anger issues. Another issue this time, though, more serious. An officer, same PD, was charged and convicted of unlawfully manufacturing and selling firearms. He was building rifles and pistols and was using a pawn shop to help sell them because they had an FFL, Federal Firearms License, and was forcing the owner to sell him parts for a cheaper price. He was also found to be selling the drugs he took off of people. The police department has taken so many hits from these incidents that the city forces them to have multiple cameras in the cars. All officers have to have body cams they can't turn off unless they're going to the bathroom. They also can't have their guns directly on them at their desks. They have to be locked in a safe next to their desk to deter them from pulling it out and shooting a computer, I guess. I've decided to not work there and find employment with a department that has a better reputation, which sadly is hard. Story 14. My friend worked as a cop at a local city. He told us a story of how he was nearly arrested by a cop when he was a cop. He and three of his fellow officers were having a night of drunken antics related to a bachelor's party. At one point, while definitely intoxicated, his friend decided it was a good idea to throw a hot dog covered in mustard and ketchup at a uniformed officer from a neighboring town. Direct hit to the back of the head. Everyone was silent for a second. Then the officer came over and started angrily talking to them. 
None of them could keep their composure because, well, the alcohol. And the fact that condiments were dripping down this cop's neck as he spoke. Needless to say, they were thrown in the drunk tank but never formally charged. Story 15. I was the head of the unit dealing with intimate offenses and child protection. We served a number of police precincts called a cluster. A young woman was arrested for theft at one of the police stations that resided under us. Her mother was the complainant. The daughter had a serious substance addiction and had previously stolen from her mother, who gave her a last warning after the second to last time. A substantial, for them, amount of cash had gone missing. And when confronted by her mother, the daughter denied any knowledge of it. So deciding that it was time for a tough love, she took her daughter to the police station, opened a case, and had her arrested. Later that evening, the mother discovered that instead of hiding the money in the inside pocket of the coat which she was hanging in her wardrobe, she had inserted the envelope containing the cash into a coat sleeve. In other words, there was no theft. She immediately returned to the police station, explained to them what had happened, made a withdrawal statement, and was told her daughter would be released imminently, but that because the case docket was already with the detectives, only they could release her, not the police in the charge office. Enter the rotten apple of a detective. Upon hearing that a withdrawal statement had been made, he booked the suspect out of the cells and took her to his office, where he told her that he could make the case go away if she did something nice for him in return. He then talked her into banging him, following which he had released her from custody. Only upon returning home and hearing her mother's profuse apology did the daughter realize what had happened. Cue the assault complaint, the case docket of which ended with me. Long story short, we summarily arrested the detective, a seasoned veteran of more than 15 years' service, recovered the used rubber in his office, and he was convicted. I don't remember the exact sentence, but it was in excess of 10 years. This is one of the most disgusting abuses of power, just straight up taking advantage of another human being, using your rank and coercion as an excuse, I guess. I think it's pretty undeniable that what the cop did constitutes as assault, and I'm glad it was treated as such. Story 16. In my shortish time in law enforcement, I never arrested another cop, although I did arrest correction officers, both for domestic violence-related incidents. But I did have several officers I knew well who arrested officers from our agency and even worked with a couple of guys who ended up getting arrested. I only knew of one guy catching flack for arresting a fellow officer. The officer arrested was extremely well-liked and the offense was pretty iffy, the kind of thing you wouldn't typically arrest a random person for. However, it came out later. It was just the tip of the iceberg. Most cops I discuss these matters with really have no issue with you if you arrest another cop for legitimate reasons. The professional courtesy is definitely a thing. An officer will likely get the benefit of the doubt. If you commit a borderline act, an officer is likely to turn their head the other way. It's called officer discretion, and most officers will do the same for nurses, teachers, other first responders, or someone who is just kind. But if you have legitimately screwed up, you're most likely going to jail. If you've made it this far in the video, hit that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. It helps the channel grow. Story 17. They ran what they called integrity tests on suspected officers from other officers letting them know, breaking the law and abusing the badge. In one such case, they put an undercover officer, he was a black officer, in a nice car from impound, had him drive normal down a highway, the suspected cop was patrolling. They would put drugs or a bag of money under the driver's seat. There are cameras and microphones placed throughout the vehicle. Upon pulling over the undercover cop, they would have him exit the vehicle and search it. Once they found drugs or money, they would take a bunch and stuff it into their vests and then tell him they found nothing and that he could continue on their way. In most cases, this was thousands and thousands of dollars and or lots of drugs. They allow the officer to finish his shift and before he gets home, he's arrested and interrogated. They offer him a choice. Be fired. And keep your pension if you can also tell them other officers who did the same thing, because some crowds roll together or not say anything and be fired. No pension and possibly jailed. Either way, never an officer again. If they honestly didn't know anyone, eh, they still lose pension. Story 18. Used to work for the police and arrested a few cops. First one was my first shift ever on the beat. I was walking around the city and had a complaint about an abusive guy who was calling women names and yelling about how ugly they are. I wasn't too phased, I thought, uh, probably just a drunk. As we walked over to speak with the guy, he started yelling about how he was in his right, and we all agreed, eh, uh, you can have an opinion, but just keep things quiet. It was a very simple conversation, and after taking his details to issue a ticket, he just snapped. 
He threw his briefcase at my partner and kicked him in the junk. Well, we had warrant for arrest, so took him down and cuffed him. As we took him down, his glasses broke on his face and cut him up a bit. Nothing major, so we took him back to the holding cell. At this point, he said to me, did you know I have a 12-inch dog? And my real name is blank, blank, blank. We all had a laugh. I finally got some time to run his name through the system and boom, police inspector. This is one of the highest ranks in Vic Paul. So being an inspector, I called my boss. She came in and said, oh crap, this guy used to teach at the academy. Then he runs at her and tries to headbutt her. That doesn't go well and he ends up on the ground with a big lump on his head. Someone gave him a wall to headbutt instead. After a few hours, he sobered up and was sent home. The court case carried on for three years. I've since left the force, and he was fired shortly after that altercation. Story 19, former U.S. Army military police officer. I never arrested another MP, but I myself was arrested by an MP in a different unit on the same post. Long story short, I just bought a Jeep, and after PT one morning, me and my buddies went for a ride back on the range roads at J.B. Lewis McCord. My platoon was on graveyard shift, so we had the day to ourselves after PT. Anyway, so my buddies and I are hauling at about 55 miles per hour down a tank trail, which civilian vehicles are not permitted on. When I come across a hard ball, pavement, around a hard curve, I was going too fast to try and stop before the intersection, so I sailed through it. And just as I did, an MP unit on duty was on the hard ball and nearly T-boned me. I immediately stopped. The MP driving jumped out of the car, ordered me out of mine, handcuffed me, and put me in the back of his car. After he got everyone's ID and cooled off from being nearly involved in a serious accident, he came to the back of the car to question me, which went like this. What unit are you in? Uh, 704th MP. What are you, a mechanic or... No, I'm an MP. Jesus Christ, are you kidding me? What the hell? Yeah, I'm an idiot. Pretty embarrassing, damn it. And then he slams the door. After about 10 minutes of him hawing with his partner on what to do with me, they decided to take me directly to my first sergeant, and so he did walked me all the way to her office in handcuffs for the entire unit to see at like 9 or 10 a.m. He gave me a bunch of tickets and turned me loose to her. Those tickets are still part of my federal record. I did a FOIA request on myself several years ago from DOD, and those were some of the documents they sent me copies of. It's the one and only time I've ever been arrested, and it was by a fellow cop. Story 20. My husband arrested an officer that took in a runaway minor in exchange for favors. Dude was an officer placed at the kid's school, Kid was a missing teenage boy, like 16 or 17. Cop was getting him drugs and alcohol, too. Husband was put on the missing persons case. Once the parents reported him missing, he was supposed to have gone with friends for spring break. It was pretty fast, like two to three days. All the kid's friends knew. Cop had a party house for minors, basically. Creep. Story 21. LAPD off-duty officer pulls up next to a black man and starts racially harassing him car to car. The second guy starts returning the insults. First guy pulls his gun, second guy pulls his gun and shoots first. This ends up ending the life of the first guy. Second guy was LAPD, also undercover, and also off-duty, also in LA. Count sheriffs were notorious for seriously abusing prisoners in jails. FBI finally decides to do an investigation and inserts an informant into the jail system. Sheriff's deputies figure it out and disappear the prisoner into the vast gulag that is the LA prison system and two senior deputies go to the house of the FBI supervisory special agent in charge of the whole investigation and tell her to back off or else. She doesn't back off. Investigation found a lot of crime and corruption by LACIS, such that the actual Los Angeles Count Sheriff ended up in prison for a long term, so long that he will probably die there. He appealed to be freed because reasons, and the judge said, no frickin' way. You serve the whole term, and if you die in Cena, too bad. Story 22, not me but I haven't seen anyone mention the video from a few years ago when the female cop ran down another cruiser that was going way, way over the speed limit and didn't have its lights on or call in anything. I don't recall names, but she saw another cruiser burning down the highway and took off after him. She followed him for a few miles and finally got him to pull over. Once they stopped, she got out and pulled her gun, ordering him to get out over the speaker. He complained, but finally got out, and she put him on the ground and in the back of her cruiser. The dude had no reason to be going that fast and was doing it just because he was a cop and thought he could. It was national news when it happened, and if I remember correctly, thousands of police departments across the country were doing illegal record checks on her, which goes into a system, but that'll come later. And she was getting death threats in her mail. I don't recall what led to the discovery, but she found out about the illegal background checks on her, 
and won a ridiculous amount of lawsuits. Story 23. Nawakop was a real active guy, friendly and helpful to the community at large. Anyway, he left state police for county sheriff and started down a wrong path. So much so that his fellow officers ran a sting on him with city police, busted him for selling license plates slash driver's ID information to some of the local gang leaders. I guess the gang leaders didn't like him either because they tipped off the cops about this dude before the cops had fully gathered enough evidence to go after him themselves. I'm not sure if he's still in prison or not, but he definitely got time there. And I believe his quote when he realized he was stung was, you can take the hood out of the boy, but you can't take the boy out of the hood. Story 24. My story's about how my dad almost got arrested. In Australia, after the Port Arthur shooting, semi-automatic weapons were banned. The police had a buyback system where you could surrender your weapon for reimbursement. My dad was a cop at the time, and he asked his superior officer if he could take the stocks off the rifles, as many of them were valuable types of wood and he liked wood carving. He was granted permission and did so, while some other cop trying to make a name for himself reported him for stealing semi-automatic weapon parts. My parents weren't allowed to leave the town for months as the proceedings went on, and they were ostracized by their friends and fellow officers. The superior officer denied giving permission to avoid trouble, and Dad was brought before a judge. The judge took one look at the evidence and said, I was told this was about a police officer stealing semi-automatic weapon parts. And this is what we're here for? He was furious about the waste of time and dismissed the case immediately, so I guess the story of how a cop tried to arrest another cop for clout. Story 25. Not me, but my uncle, who's a cop in rural Louisiana told me about a time when he and his partner got drunk on a quiet night and had a real life family guy scene. When it was time to go home, they got up, and before my uncle's partner got in the car, my uncle told him he was under arrest for DUI or something of the sort. Like I said, they were both drunk. Well, anyway, my uncle handcuffed his partner behind the back and handcuffed the handcuffs to the railing of the area where you stopped to eat lunch out in the middle of bum frick nowhere. Then my uncle, equally as drunk as him, Felt like he had solved the problem and drove home, leaving his drunk partner handcuffed to a pole at night in the middle of nowhere. Then when he didn't come home, the guy's wife called the police and the police called my uncle, but he was passed out drunk. So the rest of the small town police officers went out looking for the two. Two deputies found his partner asleep next to the pole and the sheriff found my uncle asleep in his underwear on the couch at his house. Needless to say, both of them almost lost their jobs. Story 26. Not a police officer, but similar story. My dad was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma. After his final round of chemo, he was in rough shape and on a feeding tube. I moved up to North Carolina in order to help him out for a few weeks and take care of him. He wasn't permitted to drive and he could barely even walk 23 hours a day. One morning I had to wake up early for his doctor's appointment. It's about 6, 30 a.m. and I'm laying in bed while I hear a massive boom outside of his apartment complex. While I'm contemplating what happened, the noise happens a second time. I look outside the window, which has a direct view of the road. My dad's truck is all crooked in the parking spot, and I immediately get nervous. I quickly go check on him, and to my surprise, he's not in bed. I run out to the living room and find him sleeping on his sofa. I quickly wake him up and start yelling at him, asking if he drove his truck. He couldn't remember, so we both immediately run outside and find multiple vehicles completely annihilated. Keep in mind his apartment complex runs on a loop, and there's one main road to get you through the whole place, and everyone parks on that main road. As we're outside, someone shouts, he's up by the clubhouse, which is like a hundred yards away from us. My dad can barely walk, no shoes on, we're both in our PJs, yet he scurries around to his pickup and finds his truck completely smashed all around his tailgate. Another truck nearby completely had his front end pushed in. We were all surprised because these are full-size trucks, and it's hard to do damage like that to a truck. We end up walking to the clubhouse where a severely drunken man is trying to buy a soda in the vending machine. We call the police and they show up. We eventually find out there's three more cars completely destroyed, one complex ahead of ours. Turns out he was incredibly drunk and high on coke. Once the cops come, they won't arrest him at first. So we start asking questions and it turns out that he was the captain of the local police force. They had to wait for the highway patrol to come arrest him. It was a crazy day and there's even more to the story after the accident. Story 27. Got a call of a taxi passenger handling a gun. No robbery, just a backseat craphead who wouldn't stop when asked by the driver. The driver dropped him at a hotel. I get a team together and we poke around the hotel. Craphead is found in a hallway, slumped, 
drunk on the floor with his 45 next to him. We get his gun and discover he's a cop from a coastal city about an hour away. He was in town for, and it was almost too good to be true, a cop convention. Arrested him and made sure to call his chief in the morning. Story 28. My dad was a cop. At the time, my parents were going through a divorce, and my mother had a new boyfriend of about four months. Boyfriend was a jerk. Hit my mom. Told my sister if she didn't have a job, she would have to move out. I fought the guy a couple times myself as I was in middle school and pretty big. Never got crazy serious or anything. While my dad hears about all of this and tells boyfriend he better not hurt or threaten anyone in his family ever again, including my mom. Boyfriend goes crazy, starts cursing at my dad, calling him all sorts of names, including racial slurs. Skip forward a few weeks and my dad gets a call from my sister that the boyfriend is threatening to kick her out of my mom's house if she doesn't get a job soon. Sister is 16, by the way, so dad goes over to pick my sister up. Here's where it gets interesting. My dad, a trained cop who's a part of the SWAT team, was a running back in college. Benches more than 405 at the time, at 230 pounds, 6 foot 2. Sees the guy. The guy just books it. It's one of those animal instinct things where the mom's boyfriend knows he messed with the kids, so he starts running. And this only infuriates my dad. Dude runs out the back door into the alley and my dad chases him, catches him about four houses down and just pounds into him. No mercy. Until my mom throws herself between them to stop my dad. My dad knew he shouldn't have let his emotions get the best of him. He called the cops on himself and the cops came and arrested him. Dad was let free same night and two days later gets a call from his lieutenant, and they talk for a while about the situation. A couple more days go by, and Dad gets a call back, telling him he needs to come pick his badge up and get his job back. Funniest part is, Mom's boyfriend then hears about this and tries to sue my dad. Judge decides my dad was defending his family and is only required to pay for the broken glasses, not even the hospital bills. A mom broke up with the boyfriend a couple weeks later. I hear stories about this, and I just have to wonder, what did your mom see in this dude? Sounds like he was just a piece of garbage. The dad here, it could be argued he overstepped, you know, but also took accountability for his actions. He just called the cops on himself and was like, what happens, happens. I deserve what I get, and what he got, well, wasn't too bad. Story 30. Not a cop, but I worked at a police station as a dispatcher. Patrolman responded to an accident out on the highway state police jurisdiction usually, and found the operator was drunk. He was a state trooper and known to be a drunk and always covered for. Guy got arrested before state police arrived. The patrolman weeks after had state police find him during his shift and thanked him for arresting the drunk trooper. They'd been sick of seeing him walk all the time. That patrolman has since gone out to become a chief in Metro Boston area. Story 31. I'm not the cop, but there's a cop in my town that everyone hates. He's a meme. We all know him. We'll call him, uh... C.C. was invited to a work party. He decided not to go because he doesn't really have many friends in the workforce. By the way, we're Slavic. C. then proceeded to park his car on duty right by the first turn from the bar the party was at. C. then proceeded to do an alcohol check on every one of his colleagues that drove by. Almost everyone got fined. If the test showed zero, zero one percent over the limit, they got a fine. He even forbid some from driving their car home. They had to get a cab. C didn't have many friends after that night. His higher-ups had to call him in for a meeting because none of the cops would have come to work the next day because of what he did. Another fun fact, C is notorious for leaving tickets on cars for the smallest thing. You left your car on the curb while you jumped to the ATM, literally a good meter from the car. Oh, ticket. Parked a few millimeters over the line. Ticket. This dude ticketed his wife at some point. The lady came home with the ticket, calmly handed it to him, and told him he's paying for it. Story 32. I arrested my former FTO, who had since left for another agency, for domestic assault. He moonlighted as a bouncer at an adjacent town's dive bar. Most agencies have stringent policies in place against this now, but not back then. Long story short, he got drunk after the club shut down, drove home, then proceeded to beat the crap out of a vexed wife. I got there and he immediately tried to downplay it. EMS had to transport her to the local hospital where she was treated for a fractured orbital, and etc. Gave him the, you shouldn't have put me in this position speech and took his butt to jail. Wife later attempted to drop the charges, only to be disappointed by the DA. Story 33. There was a case in the Philippines where a cop shot an older lady and an adult man together, point blank. The old lady was that man's grandmother, hugging him on the scene. 
because the adult man and the cop were arguing and it was getting heated. The cop's daughter was also at the scene. After the heated argument, the cop shot both the old lady and the adult man. This all happened in front of that cop's daughter, who, by the way, wasn't even a teenager. Story 34. Not me, but my dad. He was a patrol officer for 17 years till he was harassed by members of the good old boy system to the point of leaving. He was approached by a woman who said she was pulled over for a DUI. The cop let her go if she slept with him. This guy took advantage of over 15 women. I bet a lot more, but they didn't come forward. After my father turned him in, the higher-ups tried to cover it up, but he brought it to the DA who actually did something. The guy was tried a few counties over and was only put on one-year probation. My father was shunned for turning in a brother, and a local PD is still full of abusive jerks. One-year probation for that is absolutely a joke. Huge props to your dad op. In my opinion, he absolutely did the right thing and shouldn't have been punished like that. Story 35, when my cousin was hired on at the sheriff's office, he was assigned a mentor to help him get up to speed on the job. The mentor was a well-respected sergeant. About a month or two into his training, the sheriff had my cousin come into his office to give him a new assignment. The assignment was to investigate his mentor without his mentor, knowing he was doing so. The instructions the sheriff gave him were kind of vague on purpose. Since he was still new at the job, my cousin didn't think anything of it, thinking it was just a training exercise. After about two months of investigating and doing what he thought he was supposed to do, the sheriff called him in for an update. He asked what he'd learned. My cousin thought this was a test to see how he was doing on the job, so he presented the sheriff with what he'd learned. The sheriff's reaction wasn't what my cousin was expecting. The sheriff was both disappointed and pleased. With the sheriff reacting the way he did, my cousin thought he'd screwed up and did something wrong. It was in this meeting that the sheriff informed my cousin that what he'd been doing was a legitimate investigation. And yes, it was a sort of test to see what kind of deputy he'd be. But it was more about having someone impartial or without bias investigate. So there would be no chance someone would overlook things on purpose and let the guy being investigated get away with it. The sheriff was very pleased with the job my cousin had done, but disappointed. The sergeant was doing what he had suspected. The guy being investigated was due to retire in a year. However, there were complaints filed against him and discrepancies in some of his reports. Turns out he was using civil forfeiture as a way to steal people's things and then selling them on Facebook Marketplace. My cousin's investigation led to the sergeant being fired, charged, and sent to jail. Story 36. I used to be the supervisor for the hostage negotiation team. Our offices were together with the SWAT teams, so almost all of our calls out were together working as one big joint unit. Everyone is used to getting called at all hours of the day and night. So one night I get a call from my lieutenant at three in the morning to be downtown at the main headquarters as soon as I could. No more details than that, even when I pressed for more info. So, of course, one's mind really starts to wander. What the hell did I do is what starts going through my mind on the drive down. Once in the roll call room, I meet up with the other SWAT officers and supervisors. Same thing. What do you think we all did? One guy says, uh... We just ask for take-home vehicles. I bet it's the brass showing us they can get us out of bed in the middle of the night to chew everyone out just for asking. After a couple of minutes, in walks all the top brass, along with several FBI agents. The briefing was that six officers and one sergeant had been escorting and protecting shipments of coke through the city. It was also an undercover operation with an undercover FBI agent and fake loads of dope. Also, they were being paid several hundred dollars. The sergeant was paid two to four thousand for setting it all up. He was the brains, or lack thereof, behind it all. So we were to break up into six teams of a sergeant, two SWAT officers and two FBI agents, each taking a substation precinct house. All these officers worked the daylight shift, so we were to make the arrest hopefully just before roll call, when they could possibly be alone and outgunned. The whole time I'm thinking to myself, this is BS. There's no way that six guys could get together and pull this kind of thing off. Most of them were idiots. So BS just keeps going on in my head. Luckily, our target came to work early that morning as we were set up with the SWAT officers on surveillance in the parking lot and myself with the FBI inside. The target officer walks in with his gun belt around his shoulder and the signal was given to take him into custody. Pretty smooth arrest without any problems. I said, Manuel, these guys want to speak with you. After they tell him he's under arrest and read him his rights, all he says is, okay. At that point, I realized it probably wasn't BS. They all pleaded guilty to a couple years in federal prison except one who fought it and ended up with seven years. Story 37, being a cop for 15 years. 
One night we get a call for a large fight in the middle of the street outside a troubled bar in town. When I arrive, a neighboring town cop had tasered a guy who was pounding on this guy and refusing commands. The guy was a cop in the next town over. He was arrested along with three other cops who were all involved in the bar fight. One victim and one cop were both injured and required immediate medical attention. It all started over a bar stool. Of course, they were all pretty drunk. I'm pretty sure five of these cops were fired. One got jail time and a sergeant of that town was demoted. It was a complete crap show. Story 38. There was a patrol officer cheating incident in Georgia that ended up with an entire class fired minus three who left for other reasons. Another story is not mine, but it was told to me by a college roommate. Her father was an MP and they lived on base. Another young newbie MP started following and harassing her and pulling her over all the time for absolutely nothing. She had dash cams installed by her dad for her safety, all to try and frisk her or whatever. She finally told her dad because she was scared and he went full out, arresting the guy and getting him kicked out. Fortunately, his long record of being a solid MP and the clear evidence against that guy worked in her favor. She still had to get a protective order until she left for college, but luckily the MP department stood by her and her dad and protected her. Pretty screwed up it even happened, though. Story 39. I wasn't the arresting officer in any of these cases, but over the past 20 years, guys who went through the training center at the same time as me were arrested for one. Domestic violence. Whacked his wife over the head with a bar stool. Two. Guy got caught with a massive stash of child content. Three. Abusing a child. Four. Drunk driving. At least three colleagues fired for this. Five. Drunk in charge of firearm. Guy turned up at the house of his ex, crap-faced, waving his Glock in the air and six, theft of government property, stealing police kits from colleagues for his personal collection. None of these arrests came as any surprise to those of us who trained alongside them. Story 40, former Air Force Security Forces officer, had to apprehend one of my troops for not following orders. I will call him a 1C Charlie. He was already awaiting court-martial for drugs, but he kept not showing for his relieved of duty duty. Him not showing up was becoming a running gag around the squadron. I would always have to send a patrol over to his room and bring his butt in, then write him a letter of reprimand for not showing up. I called these Charlie runs, and the guys at the main desk got used to dispatching patrols to pick him up. And it got to the point that they knew what to do whenever they saw me coming down the stairs. I ended up ordering him in writing to show up. Surprise, the next day he didn't. I asked the squadron CO, sir, can I just apprehend him? He responded with sure in the tone of, hey, that's a pretty good idea. So we bring him in in Article 15 for disobeying that written order, a 1C, Charlie becomes MN. Charlie, several weeks pass by and nothing changes. By this point, a half of my job is dealing with his buffoonery. I just couldn't get through to him that he was only making his situation worse. Worse, we finally convinced Jag to move for pretrial confinement. We have a patrol bring him in for the last time and have him report in to the CO, a lieutenant colonel who had agreed with my assessment that this was half my job. AMN Charlie becomes a resident of our in-house detention center. JAG apparently thought I handled this well. They had me testify in the sentencing phase of his court-martial that finally happened, and I told the same story I'm writing here. Airman Charlie becomes Airman Basic Charlie and gets 10 months plus a bad conduct to discharge, which means he's blacklisted for life. Story 41. No arrest, but did write another officer a citation for excessive speed in my county. He was just passing through, but was driving his police vehicle. When I passed him going the opposite direction, my front-facing radar showed that he was speeding, so I flashed my lights like I always did for everyone as a warning to slow down. Story 42. Most people see the lights and think, oh crap, and slow down. I can watch their speeds drop in my rear-facing radar. This guy just flashes his lights back at me and keeps speeding the opposite direction. I debate with myself for a second before flipping around. I catch up to him and light him up, and he basically ignores me. I tap the siren a couple of times. Same thing. Finally, I turn it on and leave it on. He responds by turning his lights on and continues to refuse to stop. Now I'm debating whether to call another unit to assist, and right before I do, he pulls over. He gets out of his car and is at my door before I'm even in park. He is mad. Refuses to provide a license. Refuses to cooperate. Just an all-around angry guy. He demands that I call the sheriff to the stop, which I do. Sheriff gets there, listens to my story, verifies the radar lock numbers before basically telling this guy, give me your documents or you're being arrested. The guy complies and I cite him for excessive speed. He takes a citation and documents and drives away. Mad as hell. That was my only interaction ever involving another officer. 
What did this guy think when he flashed his lights back? Was he just like, nah, nah, it's good. I'm an officer, or what? Did he expect some random level of camaraderie from this officer who he doesn't know at all? Because, hey, buddy, speeding, still speeding. I didn't arrest, but process the digital evidence for two cases that come to mind. One was criminal inappropriate conduct against a family friend minor. Officer ended his own life. One was possession of child content by a metro area officer. He was charged, lost job slash licensure, and went through the system. Pretty typical outcomes for most walks of life charged with similar. Another time I was involved in a warrant regarding possession of child content, but I wasn't the lead examiner. Not sure what turned up with that case. People think cops aren't investigated ever, but in my short stint working in investigations, we've definitely investigated and charged police. The narrative that it doesn't happen is quite misleading. Maybe not as much as it should, but I wish people wouldn't be so hyperbolic, lest the police become what you actually believe them to be. Story 43. Late 80s, I worked for a medium-sized police department in Arkansas. My partner and I made what appeared to be a routine drug arrest. Typical procedure was to run warrants on anyone you were detaining or going to arrest. So in doing that, the suspect's name goes out over the radio. Flash forward a half hour or so when we pull into the sally port and get the suspect out of the car. As we're doing that, another officer appears out of nowhere and for no obvious reason has joined himself to us and the suspect. Keep in mind, there was no reason whatsoever for him to be there. None. As we get the suspect into the elevator, the officer is still right there. It becomes obvious to us that something weird was going on. His eyes were bulging out of his head, veins popping out of his neck, and his adrenaline was pumping. He wasn't high, just enraged. It's about at that time that our suspect pops off and says, What are you doing here? I was smoking crack with you just last week, or something to that effect. In an instant, the officer jumps at our suspect, grabs him by the throat, and lifts him off the ground trying to choke him out. It took both of us to pull him off. He was told in no uncertain terms to get out of that elevator. Despite the blue wall we hear about all the time, we reported what happened to our superiors. He was brought in, drug tested, and failed the test. He was terminated. I'd known this officer most of my life. My dad was an officer with the same department when I was a kid. He was nearing retirement age, and he was a good cop, at least until this. While my partner and I did not arrest this other, we initiated the events that led to his arrest and the end of his career. Last I heard, he has gotten clean and had gone to work for a small department in Arkansas. On a side note, in the six years I spent in law enforcement, this was one of only two instances where I saw an officer cross the line and use too much force or unwarranted force. It's not as common as some people think, at least not in the department I worked for. The other instance was another partner I worked with. We arrested a guy for drunken disorderly from a bar late into the wee hours. Once we got the suspect into the car, he started mouthing at my partner that he knew where he lived. He did know, mentioning he had seen the officer's pretty wife and his pretty little girl about two years old, and in graphic detail began to tell my partner how he was going to assault and brutalize his wife and baby daughter. For ten minutes or so, while we drove to the jail, the suspect went on and on about his intentions. This guy had a record of violent and inappropriate offenses and was fully capable of carrying out those threats. I could see my partner about to blow a gasket and I couldn't blame him. I casually mentioned that I was busy filling out the paperwork and probably couldn't see anything in the back of the car. It was at this time, having accelerated to about 60 miles per hour, that a cat ran out into the road. In an attempt to avoid hitting the poor sweet creature, my partner violently slammed the brakes. Sadly, we had failed to secure the suspect in a seatbelt causing said suspect to crash into the metal divider that separated us from the suspect, face first into a metal grate, 60 to zero in short order. Having safely brought the vehicle to a stop in a deserted portion of downtown, saving the life of that cat, I again casually mentioned that I was extremely busy and occupied filling out the arrest report and would have no idea what went on in the back of the car. I will admit I heard some strange noises, Noises that sounded very much like a nightstick bouncing off every possible part of a suspect's body, but I can't be too sure. Um, especially seeing that I never looked back there. For some odd reason, the suspect had an abundance of injuries to his face and head and the rest of his body. I suppose that emergency stop to save the cat really did a number on him. Flash forward a week and we're now in court with said suspect who admittedly didn't look good and he's singing at the top of his lungs that he was the victim of police brutality. The judge, we called him Hangum Hudson, and we're now in court with said suspect, who admittedly didn't look good.
and he's singing at the top of his lungs that he was the victim of police brutality. The judge, we called him Hangum Hudson, calls my partner and I up to the bench and ordered the attorneys on both sides to stay back. He asked my partner to tell him what happened. The officer was a great cop with a reputation for absolute honesty. My partner knew I would have gone to jail to protect him. I wouldn't have lied on the stand, but I would have refused to testify to what happened. But my partner told the absolute truth. Word for word, event for event. He was fully prepared to lose his freedom and career. But this is Hangum Hudson. Don't forget. It was at this moment that we were instructed to go back to our seats. And with but a look, both the prosecution and defense attorneys were given clear instructions. They were not to object to what was about to happen. No one crossed this judge ever. The judge, having heard no testimony from either side, saved my partner's testimony, slammed down his gavel, gave the defendant the maximum jail time for drunk and disorderly. Six months, I think. The defendant wailed in protest, but was told to shut up by his defense attorney because the judge could easily make things a lot worse. We never heard anything else from the guy or his attorney again. That is the one and only instance in my six years of law enforcement where I would have willingly given up my career or freedom to protect a fellow officer. I would have done the same thing if it had been my wife and child being threatened. Story 44. The prosecuting attorney for the county of my hometown gave me nine months in county jail for half a pound of pot. The following year, a major coke bust happened and the person who got caught ratted on the PA and two local state cops. And it turns out the PA was the major supplier for three counties and the state cops were running loads for him. He got fired and state boys got transferred. Woman who busted had no charges filed. Same town, five years later, the mayor hits a 16-year-old kid and ends his life while driving drunk. He hides his truck and two weeks later, they find the vehicle and all he got was two years probation. He was still the mayor till the end of the year. I've met some law officials who were worse crooks than anyone I knew at the time. Story 45, not a cop, but I work with police departments daily. This was told to me by a now-retired chief of a tiny suburban PD. Total staff of around 12. Virtually no crime. Boring for the most part. They had an officer who always wanted to work Friday and Saturday nights, since it meant quieting down parties and getting drunks off the road. Speculation was that this guy would find a quiet spot to park and catch a few Zs. Now that wasn't necessarily a problem. But when a call for service came in, you had to do your job. One Saturday night, a call came into dispatch reporting a black SUV exiting the town's public works facility. This officer was given the call. A short time later, he radioed that nothing was found. Case closed. What the officer didn't know was that the chief had recently installed GPS in each patrol car. The chief could look at his phone and see where each car was located. The chief heard the call come over the radio and looked at his phone. The car that supposedly went to public works never moved from its hiding spot. Hmm. The town had also installed cameras at the public works garage. The chief asked to see the video for the prior Saturday night. There was the black SUV pulling up to the town's gas pumps, filling it up. The driver of the SUV was in uniform, a police uniform. The SUV was the cop's personal vehicle. The next Saturday night, the chief and his lieutenant staked out at the fuel pumps. At one point, the same black SUV pulled up to the pumps and the fuel started to flow. The chief and lieutenant popped out from the shadows and greeted their colleague. They placed him under arrest for stealing government property. Ultimately, the charges were dropped. But the cop lost his 100 000 cush job, his medical coverage, and his pension. He agreed to never seek employment in law enforcement anywhere in the state. Last anyone heard, he was working construction. Story 46. About 15 years ago, I arrested a man who was suspended by his belt from an ornate spike on a Victorian gate. He was drunk, had taken a shortcut through a park to get to his hotel. It was late at night, so the park was closed. He would tried to climb over the gate, clearly slipped as his jeans were ripped with blood on them. He was somewhat abusive from memory, and when we got him down, he refused medical treatment. Ambulance had been called. I arrested him. I can't remember what for. Possibly a public order offense. And after I placed him in the van, a colleague approached me and asked if I'd cautioned him properly. Of course I had, which was a good job, as my colleague then informed he'd checked his details and he was CID from another force. Long story short, he slept it off, was picked up by a sergeant in the morning, and was very apologetic to me also in the morning. He was in town relocating a witness for something or other and went out whilst off duty. He still refused to be treated for his injury, which we believe to be the tearing of his testicle.
Judging from the way he walked out, I believe that was the case. Story 47, former corrections officer here. Reported a fellow co-worker when I noticed that she was in the lockdown unit speaking with the same inmate repeatedly. She was in a different unit and technically had no business in this unit. Come to find out she was sneaking stuff into the jail, phones, drugs, etc. for this particular inmate. After she was terminated, she was arrested and booked into our jail a few times. Sad thing is, we conducted strip searches on all intakes, so co-workers who used to work with her had to conduct the mandatory search. She wound up having a relationship with the inmate once he was released, and he was easily 15-plus years younger than her and told me he did it because it was easy to manipulate her. Had another co-worker arrested for homicide and attempted manslaughter when he shot his girlfriend and the bullet went through her and hit the child she was holding at the time. The mom passed away and the child was hit in the leg. He was placed on administrative leave pending the investigation, so he was still on the payroll until he was actually arrested. Never saw that one coming. Story 48. Not a law enforcement officer, but my brother is. Male officer moves into female's house. Female has a teenage daughter. You know where this is going. Female officer comes home from work to find male officer assaulting her 14-year-old daughter on the living room couch. Mom was in uniform. How she didn't end his life right there is a testimony to her restraint. Man jumps into his city-subsidized personal police vehicle and takes off. A half-hearted manhunt ensues. Bad judgment guy was found sitting in the middle of a rural highway with self-inflicted superficial cuts to his wrists. A serrated steak knife was recovered. Officers had to literally pick him up, bleeding and crying, and stop at the ER before taking him to be booked. He got 10 years for assault. Mom is still on the force. Story 49. Not an officer, but my story probably qualifies. I was driving home from classes one day and got pulled over for wearing headphones while driving. At the time, genuinely didn't know it was illegal. I was upset I was being pulled over as there were plenty of people passing me going fast enough to get pulled over. The officer gave me a ticket and told me my court date. He was a young guy, and I guess he just wanted to prove a point. I was very inexperienced, and still am really with courts and such. In my state, they still give you your license at the courthouse from a judge. And until this instance, that was the only time I'd ever been in a courtroom. I was nervous and asked everyone what I should do. My job at the time had a security officer, and I asked him lots of questions about what I should do and how to handle myself in the courtroom. It's just traffic court, but to me it was a big deal. As a 19-year-old who hadn't even gotten a speeding ticket. Hey, and still haven't, by the way. Well, my court date rolls around and I go to the courthouse dressed all nice. I sit down and I'm real nervous, but the courtroom is full, so I figured I'd be able to watch other people and figure out how I'm supposed to handle myself. Nope. Mm, I am the first person they call, and so I very nervously walk up to the stand. I don't know if this is how all courts are, but the officer who gives you your ticket must be present at the time of the hearing. So my officers standing next to me as I explained that I didn't know I couldn't do what I did. Also, that I have a clean record and I'm working while going to college. The judge looks over the papers of my case, looks at which officer is listed as giving me the ticket and pauses for a second. Officer Jerkbag? Uh, yes, your honor. He said with his head still directly pointed at his own shoes, a detail I hadn't noticed yet since I was so nervous. And no sooner than when I had looked back at the judge did he say, you're free to go. Court fees are waived. Have a nice day. I was so ecstatic, and it took until I got back into my car to realize that what happened was kind of strange. Come to find out, a few months later, while I was telling the story to an instructor at my gym who happened to be a rotating leader of our area's SWAT team, that officer jerkbag had been arrested two days before my court date for DUI while on the job, and he had to be restrained by three other officers, one of which was my instructor friend. I don't know what ever happened to Officer Jerkbag, but I imagine he does a lot of paperwork now. I would personally hope that he has nothing to do with the vehicle. Getting arrested as a cop for DUI is one thing, which I still think is really bad, by the way. On the job, yeah, no, absolutely not. Story 50, not a cop, but this happened in my hometown. We only had two cops. First cop pulls over a high school student. She was the hottest girl at my school, head cheerleader, all that. Her father was the mayor. This cop pulled her over doing 90 in a 45. He handcuffs her like he's going to arrest her and then proceeds to just bend her over the hood of his car and assault her right there on the side of the road. Multiple people called it in about a cop railing some chick on the hood of his car. He acted surprised when two cops showed up to arrest him. Wish I could have seen his face when he found out whose daughter that was. She was only 16 and ended up getting pregnant and she kept the baby. 
quit school because people kept teasing her and making fun of her about it. Cop only got six months and was out on probation soon after. Got beat up a few times, too, by friends of the family. Only six months? You're kidding me. This is insane. There are a lot of stories in here about some people getting off easy with stuff, but this is absurd. How did this happen? And that was the rest who I, I'm baffled. I honestly hope this story isn't real because it kind of just infuriates me. Story 51. There is a good true crime case with interview footage of a female detective in the U.S. who ended her ex-lover's partner and got away with it for about 10 years. Then detectives from her own station brought her in for questioning about it. After that, murder was investigated again as a cold case. It was very interesting the way they went about it, telling her they had some questions they needed to ask her and wanted to keep it all on the down low from the rest of the station, not telling her what it was about and trying not to raise her suspicions so that they could get her into the interview room knowing full well they were about to arrest her for murder after the questioning. She was convicted and got life. The evidence they had against her in the end was overwhelming, and makes you wonder why she wasn't caught when she did it. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and click the link in the description to join our community. You can check out this video on your screen in the meantime, and I will see you in the next one.